We're in budget. Governor. Alex, we're down to our last two trailer bills on today's agenda. AB 1610, which is our transportation trailer bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. AB 1610 is the transportation trailer bill. The bill affects transportation programs administered by the Department of Transportation, Caltrans, the California Highway Patrol, CHP, and the Department of Motor Vehicles, DMV, as well as the state transit assistant allocations by the state controller. This bill uh, appropriates $3.9 million general fund on a one-time basis for DMV uh, to implement a new automatic voter registration process that we had uh, some conversations about during the conference committee. Additionally, this bill increases the voter registration fee by $10 from $70 to $80 per year and indexes that fee to inflation. This uh, increases the motor vehicle account revenues by approximately $1.7 billion over the next five years. Additionally, the bill uh, includes a section to codify the recommendations of the United States Department of Transportation's Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration to align state law to federal regulations, which became effective on October 1st, 2016. With that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, let's start with the vehicle registration fee increase. Just want to take the sting out of the sound of those words because this is not the vehicle license fee, VLF. This is the vehicle registration fee. Vehicle license fee, of course, is based specifically on the purchase price of one's automobile, this, which is not flat. That is more progressive. Uh, the more expensive the purchase price of your car, the more you pay, the less you pay uh, for the car, the less you pay for the VLF. There's also an allowance for depreciation. So if you own your car five years, you pay half of it. Ten years, you pay none of it. And all of those VLF dollars, which of course were cut significantly in the previous administration, uh, go to cities and counties to pay for fire and police protection, to keep libraries open and streets swept clean. That is not what we're talking about here. This is a um, much smaller fee and specifically if you could better clarify for us my understanding is the funds from this fee go for california highway patrol operations there's also a need for field office repairs and seismic concerns could you give us a little bit more information about this Yes, Mr. Chair, I would say that these um, funds do go for both the operations of the Department of Motor Vehicles as well as the California Highway Patrol, and that the fund actually has a $400 million imbalance right now. $400 million. That's correct, between the operating costs and the available revenues within the fund, and so that's why this proposal hopefully will help alleviate um, that imbalance. Um, how, how long will it take to do that? Well, over the um, five-year period, uh, this will generate $1.7 billion in revenues. And at the end of that five-year period, we anticipate a, uh, I'm sorry, Mark Monroe, Department of Finance. Yes, um, we will, uh, uh, we anticipate a, a fund balance of $200 million. Very good. So do we know what the capital needs are of the field offices of the CHP? <coughs> this... This plan here um, assumes the replacement, um, I believe, of three offices a year. Um, the the uh, state uh, the resources unit has worked with both the Department of Motor Vehicles and the, the California Highway Patrol to come up with a long-term plan uh, for replacement of offices that I... Um, Do you know when the last time this fee was adjusted? Uh, yes, 2011. 2011, and at that time, five years ago, it went from what to what? Um, it went from uh, 56 to 69. I thought we were going from 46 to 56 now. Um, 
Yeah, so when you look at the, um, the what we what consider the, the registration fee when you register your vehicle, um, there are several different components of it. So when we talk about going from 70 to 80, that takes into account the registration fee component. There's a CHP component, uh, a CHP fee component. And so this, and there's a, there's a small ARB fee component that are all included in that 70 to 80 number. Okay. But this is a $10 increase of 46 to 56 specifically for this? Yes. Okay. Very good. And then I'm not sure that you uh, touched on this, Ms. Costa, this uh, state transit assistant funding allocation. So there, there's going to be a bit of a timeout in the imposition of a new formula. And clearly there are some stakeholders that had concerns. Yeah, the state what was the situation here? Uh, the state controller's office provides a formulaic distribution of diesel sales tax revenues to the local transit agencies. Beginning in the 2015-16 fiscal year, the controller used a different allocation methodology which changed eligibility criteria and the level of formula funding transit agencies received. Uh, the new methodology was used for the first and second quarter formula distributions. Uh, within the trailer bill, this section directs the controller to use the historic methodology to distribute the remaining formula formula distributions for the third and fourth quarters of 2015-16, as well as 2016-17 and 2017-18 distributions. And while we take this pause, what will be going on to resolve where we, where we will go at the end of 17-18? Uh, um, the, uh, the stakeholders will continue to meet and discuss about a, a long-term policy solution. And I would note this section is to just provide stability while those conversations are ongoing. Yes. Thank you. Herman. Yes, Senator Bell. Uh, I would like to have that recognized as a policy issue should be discussed in a policy committee. SDA formula is a very controversial issue. Should be discussed fully with hearings and as a policy issue. Just. I guess that's a good follow up question. Oh yeah. Where will these ongoing conversations with stakeholders be happening? Um, I don't yet know. My assumption is policy committee, but I don't yet know. I suspect Senator Bell will be introducing or, the bill. Well, well, we'll have a hearing on it. Yeah. All right. Very good. It's a policy issue. It's a oh, very it important is. Uh, issue regarding transit funding. So it's yes. a very, uh, very important. Colleagues, yes, Senator Stone. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I see $3.9 million. Uh, this is for the, uh, to implement the um, registration uh, uh, to the Secretary of State. I assume you're just transmitting names of um, licensees, whether they're uh, immigrants or legal citizens, if you will, to the Secretary of State. You're not going to be doing any evaluating of any status of, of immigration status, I would assume. You're just transmitting names, is that correct? That is correct. Okay. And then um, we talked about uh, the prior increase in 2011, Mr. Chair, of $12. And, uh, is it true that the $12 increase was only to be used for the connection of the regulation of vehicles, including administration costs and vehicle registration? It couldn't be used for any general fund purposes? Correct. Okay. Um, in, uh, my, in my investigations over the past number of years, there's been an annual transfer of about 70 to $80 million in revenue connected by the, uh, collected by the DMV that was transferred to our general fund. Assuming that's true, is that the funds that have been paying for the CHP? Um, allocation or is this used for non-registration um, DMV issues that can be used in general fund for any other purpose? Yes, the 70 million comes from, um, it, when you look at transportation revenues, most of them are, are protected by Article 19 of the Constitution, um, but there are certain uh, revenues, these come from, uh, if you think of uh, when you buy a, a used car and you get a Carfax report, the DMV provides information on that. They provide information to um, uh, on used vehicles, and there's a number of services that they provide, they, and they charge a fee for that. That's uh, roughly $70 million a year, and that is what's been transferred to the general fund. None of the revenues that we're talking about here. None of the revenues, okay. Uh, but those revenues that are transferred, it, does there have to be a nexus to um, vehicles, or can it be used for any purpose? It can be used for any purpose. purpose. Um, and how, and how much money will this $10 per vehicle raise? You, you probably had in the report, I didn't see it collectively. What's your estimate? 
Um, it'll start out uh, about uh, three, I want to say 380 million, um, and then that grows with the vehicle population. Okay, and this is going to be applied to every vehicle in the state of California? Correct. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Stone. Any other questions? We have a motion by Senator Wolk. Is there any public comment? Mr. Chair, members, Joshua Shaw with the California uh, Transit Association on the state transit assistance item that the chair asked about. We asked for the pause button given the changes made by the controller administratively. It's not so much we take exception to those changes, but it was the changing the rules in midstream. Uh, Senator Wolk's subcommittee had an extensive discussion of that. We want to thank her, your staff, Ms. Brock. We worked with Mr. Monroe at finance and the controller's office to perfect this language in the budget to say, please get time out and give us a couple years to work on the policy, which to answer your last question, Mr. Chair, we've already initiated those conversations with stakeholders, transit agencies, regional agencies, controller and finance. We plan to frame up a bill for the policy chair's consideration and the policy chair and the assembly and all other stakeholders who care. We hope to bring that forward as soon as we possibly can. This gives us a brief time out in the meantime. Thank you. That's great background information, Mr. Shaw. Thank you. Mr. Chair and members, Michael Pimentel here on behalf of Santa, Monica, Santa Monica's Big Blue Bus, Santa Cruz Metropolitan Transit District, Solano County Transit, San Mateo County Transit District, and Caltrain. I want to echo the comments made by Mr. Shaw and thank um, the, uh, the Chair Wolk um, for her work in the subcommittee as well as um, the committee staff uh, and to voice our strong support um, for this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pimentel. No other public comment, no other questions from the committee. Do we have a motion? Call the roll, please. AB 1610, the motion is to pass. Leno? Aye. Leno, aye. Nielsen? No. Nielsen, no. Allen? Anderson? Bell? Aye. Bell, aye. Block? Aye. Block, aye. Glacier? Hancock, aye. Hancock I, Mitchell, aye. Mitchell I, Monning, Morlock, Wynn, Pan, aye. Pan I, Pavley, Pavley I, Roth, Stone, no. Stone No, Wolk, aye. Wolk I. We have eight two, and we will keep the roll open. And then our last trailer bill to be considered today is AB 1618, our No Place Like Home proposal. Ms. Costa. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, as you stated, AB 1680 implements the program portions of the proposal known as No Place Like Home Initiative. Under this measure, the Department of Housing and Community Development will develop and administer a homelessness and affordable housing program with a focus on chronic homelessness with mental health needs. A few specifics of the program included that it authorizes HCD to spend $2 billion in bond funds um, the guidelines of which will be developed by HCD with input from counties, including uh, CSAC in the following manner. $1.8 billion allocated over at least four rounds of funding for, com for a competitive program to finance capital costs of permanent supportive housing. HCD may also establish an alternative process to allocate a portion of the competitive funding directly to counties with 5% of the homeless population and who have the capacity to administer the loan funds for permanent supportive housing on their own within the county. It provides $200 million for a non-competitive or over-the-counter program for all counties to finance capital cost of permanent supportive housing. It appropriates $6.2 million from the Mental Health Services Fund for technical assistance to those accounting to those counties applying for these funds with that we're happy to answer any questions thank you colleagues I think we're all very familiar with our no place like home proposal at this point given the conversations we've had through our budget process as well as the conference committee this of course is the implementing language and lays out some of the finer details of how the monies will be expended with regard to the competitive funds there'll be four Different categories of counties, I understand. So there'll be Los Angeles, which stands on its own because of its population. Then the next three or four largest counties, you correct me? Uh, correct. There are four 
And there are basically four categories. Uh, Los Angeles is in one category of itself. Then we have what's known as the large counties. Those are counties who have a per capita, basically a population that are above 750,000. Francisco, San Diego, San Jose. It, they, they would be included in Santa that Clara, in those right, totals, yeah. right? Any county who has a population of greater than 750,000, then you then have, you then have the uh, medium, what we call the medium-sized counties. So these would be those counties um, less than 750, but greater than, um, I believe, 200,000. And then you have what we refer to as the small counties, who would be any county who has a population less than 200,000. And then. Can you explain a little bit more of the alternative process? So let's say I'm a small county, and how am I going to decide right. which pot I want to pursue? So the alternative process is only available to those counties who have a share of the homeless population in the state that's 5% or greater. So it's not the population so of the state at that point, it's 5% or greater of the total homeless population. That is correct. And which figures, because we see such a range of different figures of chronically homeless, which numbers are we using for that base? So these are figures that uh, the Department of Housing and Community De Development have. Um, I don't recall off the top of my head exactly where where they come from, I, but I believe they come from the current census count of the homeless population that we have. Using that determinant, do you know what the total statewide number is? Uh, the homeless population, it's currently estimated to be about 115,000 in the state of California. Okay. So I'm just thinking when we talk about our chronically homeless in San Francisco, the figures somewhere around 6,500. Yeah, and I so, see figures so of 45,000 for Los Angeles County this week. Yeah, so currently there are four particular counties that meet the criteria that would be eligible for what we refer to as the alternative process. And San Francisco is one of those counties along with Santa Clara, San Diego, and Los Angeles. Got it. Colleagues, questions? Yes, Senator Bell and then Senator Nielsen. Um, you have the four categories. Are, is there sort of a um, allocation of equity based on the population of those counties? How, how, is the, um, how is the distribution handled between the four counties? Right, so the, How would that work? the four groupings, um, yeah. the, the funds in the competitive pot um, are allocated based upon the per capita, or based on the homeless population um, for each county. Um, so okay. what you would basically do is take what is the percentage of the homeless population in that county, and then you would um, apply that to the funds, okay. and that's what makes up the pot of funds. Is that relying on the annual homeless count that we do every year? Correct. Okay, so we do that homeless count. So we have to make sure every county does their homeless count, especially the large ones. And some counties don't, though, right? They're too small or they don't. Yeah, so there are some that um, have a little bit more difficulty, which is why we have, and you're, as you're yeah. correct in referring to the small counties, which is why we have a, um, a kind of a cap, per se. I guess yeah. cap's not the right word, but a floor to ensure that the small uh competitive pot, it gets at least 8% of the funds so that those small counties do have funds that they can compete for. Yeah, um, yeah, I was uh, sitting there with Senator Stone, I said, we're all in the second category. Uh, so we, we, if we add it up, um, I think the second category has more people, population than Los Angeles County. I just want to point that out, Mr. Chairman, if you add up all the counties in the second category. You know, Orange, San Diego, was it Riverside, San Bernardino, Santa Clara, right. so Sacramento? That would be the San Francisco. third category. Yeah, you know. So the second category is? Uh, the 750 or above. Right. So that's just except three. Except Los Angeles. Right, that, that would be just yeah. three, I think. Yeah, they're sort of the urban counties. Uh, but uh, so I, I feel comfortable with the homeless population count because the large counties do that and they do it pretty good. We're pretty used to doing the homeless count. I think it's a fair, obviously a fair way to do it. I, I would point out that some of the smaller counties don't do a very good job on homeless count. You know, so they mean maybe a little more, um, you don't want to be, be too administratively burdensome on their. Sure, and we plan on working with uh, CSAC as we right. develop this program and ensuring right. that the small counties are um, 
fairly treated and have an opportunity yeah. to take part in the program and compete for funds to develop programs that will benefit. But all of us, the big ones, we all do it pretty well. We have a pretty good system. Thank you, Senator Bell. Before we go further with questions, there are some committee amendments uh, I wanted to ask if you could share with us. So I think there are five main points to them. Correct. Um, so we, we, we do have five amendments that are before you today as part of uh, this trailer bill, and I'll go through them here um, one by one. Are they 31 items now? Um, yeah. Is probably the next one in Ventura. Ventura is about 800. 368, well over that's 10 million. That's a lot yeah. I just want to make that big point. Did he say how much was allocated to each category? It's based on homeless population count that each county does. So that's a fair way of doing it. Colleagues, so we do have some uh, analysis of each of the five, which we'll have the sergeants distribute right now. And we are presently getting additional copies of the amendments themselves. So we'll have sufficient copies for everybody in just a few minutes. Would you like so me to speak? why don't you just wait one moment so we can get at least the description of the amendments in front of everyone before you proceed? Anyone? Senator Pavley. Okay. I go do that and we're gonna be here a while or wait for this. Well, well Senator Pavley uh, and I are going to cast some votes in environmental quality and Senator Nielsen will take the gavel and we'll be right back. Uh, but uh, as we leave, if you could proceed with uh, describing the amendments to us. Thank you. So each of you should be receiving um, a copy of those amendments now. Um, we'll walk through them one by one. The first one is... Uh, just a, could you just tell us where the amendments came from? Were they the administration? Were they a budget yes. subcommittee? So we've been working with uh, stakeholder groups and and, and, and particularly the uh, California State Association Counties, CSAC, and um, we wanted to make sure that the language was very clear in certain areas so that we can address some um, various concerns that were raised in earlier versions of the bill. Okay, so quickly, so quickly. these are these are agreements between the administration and CSAC um, on how the uh, program can move forward. So the very first amendment is re related to the adopting of guidelines or regulations for the program. It makes it clear that as we move forward in adopting these guidelines, we are going to do it in consultation with our county partners, which is CSAC. So CSAC will be heavily involved and be right there on the front lines with the administration in developing these guidelines. Um, two, the second amendment is really a technical clarifying amendment. Instead of um, referring to um, the calculation methodology applying to the whole part that we are establishing, we specified the two um, sections of law where the competitive and the non-competitive programs are. So just instead of saying part, we specified the two code sections that refer to the two programs. Um, the next one is another um, clarifying um, amendment where we just say that the funds will be um, in proportion to their share of the percentage of the statewide homeless population as calculated um, by the department in a different code section. So we kind of already said that, but we're now saying it in a more clear way. Um, the third amendment is really um, another technical amendment where we inadvertently said developer when we meant to say development sponsor. Um, the counties are applying um, for these projects and um, there, in, in some cases the counties will apply on their own, in some cases they'll have um, development sponsors who come with them and we just wanted to make it clear uh, that it will be development sponsor, not developer. Um, the last amendment is probably the more substantive amendment in here, which is we on the non-competitive pot, which is the 200 million, we've added a floor of 500,000 so that the small counties can be ensured that they actually get a sizable um, portion of funds that they can actually do some type of project with it. Um, otherwise, as was mentioned earlier, you could have the case where some small counties homeless count would be so low that where they get what we kind of refer to as the over-the-counter funds, they may not get enough money to actually be able to do a project. Therefore, we wanted to make sure that they were going to get enough money so they can go out and do a project. Uh, as to these amendments, uh, let me walk through just a little bit. Number one, 
the in consultation with the California Association of Counties and other stakeholders, who would these other stakeholders be? Not just CSAC, there are, for example, the Regional Council of Rural Counties. Would they be one of the other stakeholders? Uh, correct. So HCD will perform a series of outreach meetings and they'll be taking um, input from all those various stakeholders, county behavioral and mental health folks, um, the rural, uh, the RCRC group, urban counties, any other um, interested folks who have a, uh, a desire to, to see the success of this program for treating, you know, uh, homeless people who have mental health needs. So that can be a wide range of, of a wide ranging group. Um, but I do want to stress that the guidelines are going to be developed in close consultation with CSAC and that we'll be seeking the input for both CSAC and the department um, in developing from the other stakeholders in developing uh, the guidelines. Amendment three funds in proportion to their share of the percentage of the statewide homeless population is calculated by HCD. Now, as calculated on what basis, uh, this is the basis of the surveys that have been taken and we now established that some counties are not gonna be uh, as uh, capable of doing valid survey work, uh, so how do you balance all right. of that so out? It's as calculated um, by the department in section 5849.6, and that particular section provides that we shall use the statewide homeless count, um, which are, involves these surveys that we, that we do. But what about, how do you deal with the counties that uh, have more difficulty establishing the count as it's been. Right, so that's where we'll be working with uh, CSAC and HCD will be working with those individual counties in order to try to get a better um, understanding of the challenges that they have in generating that population. But that's why we have in the legislation the floors for the small counties because it's really just the small counties that are struggling in that area. Okay, and then what is the significance of uh, adding developer sponsor? The sp Sponsor, what, what is the significance of that? Well, the way that we have this set up is that either the county by itself can apply for a project or the county with a development, with a developer sponsor. Um, so they can kind of do it together. Okay. Um, so we needed to just clarify that it's not the developer who's necessarily gonna have the regulatory agreement. It could be the sponsor, which could be the county. And does your last amendment, 500,000, mean that every county then will at least get 500,000? That is correct. That's that would be the minimum. And the regulations, uh, were these regulations exempt from the Office of Administrative Law Administrative Procedure process, or do they have to go through OAL? Uh, they do not have to go through OAL. They're exempted. Yeah, that's okay. Mm -hmm. I'm a little sensitive to that, but I'm probably not going to big fuss about it. Uh, any uh, quick, uh, Senator Bell. Just on a formula, you have to understand that uh, it's Prop 63 money. It, it has to be spent on mentally ill homeless. So it has to, when you do these counts on homelessness, there's, there's subdivisions of homelessness when they do the counts. Some of, them, some of the homeless are not mentally ill, some are mentally ill. And you have to get, if you want to be accurate in terms of, of the Prop 63, you should, you should really make sure that you're looking at um, homeless, mentally ill in the counts, and then make sure that the uh, CSAC, when they work on this formula thing, accommodates that um, in the formula. So I'll just make sure that, because I'm, I'm the representative of the Senate on the Prop 63 Commission, so I, I'd like to see the money spent where it's supposed to be spent. Yes. Thank Senator you, Mr. Stone. Chairman. Uh, I think you made it kind of clear that the allocation is going to be based on the number of homeless mentally ill um, against the population of the respective counties. Yet you have four different categories. Out of the $2 billion, is there a fixed amount going to each of those categories and then utilizing the formula that you have? I just ask some questions. So if, if I'm understanding right, and correct me if I'm not understanding the mm -hmm. question. But so you have the two pots, you have the 200 million, um, which we have already established as there's the floor of the 500,000 and then it'll, the rest will go out um, based upon your straight percentage. Um, for the 1.8 billion competitive program, you have your four pots. The, the money will then be spread amongst those pots based upon your um, 
based upon your count, the right. percentage. Right. And then the groups of counties in those various pots will then compete for those funds based on their projects. So there's, so. Okay, so my concern is, and maybe it's not a concern after you answer the question, is that we have LA County that's in a category by themselves. They have between 10 and 11 million people. In category two, just by uh, my, my good friend sitting next to me, we came up with about 18 million people in category two. Um, is it fair to say that there's going to be an equal amount of money given to each homeless person in those respective counties, irrespective of the category that we find them in, the one, one to four categories? So money per person? Yes. Um, no. Sure, I mean, I, I guess theoretically that's exactly how it would play out. Okay, I'm just saying, is, is there any extra weight given to a county, LA County in particular, because they're in a category by themselves? No, I mean, they are in a category by themselves given that they have the largest homeless population in the state. Understandable, so, understandable. Um, we didn't want them to have to. Okay, you made it clear, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Senator Stone. Are there other questions about these amendments or about the trailer bill itself? Senator Glazer. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I know that this, uh, this uh, program's been worked on for a very, very long time and with uh, wonderful people engaged to try to uh, make some good choices in how we uh, deal with the mentally ill and, um, and, I, and I applaud that. I was pleased to be a, uh, one of the many co-sponsors who uh, joined in January to uh, applaud this, this effort. Um, uh, at the same time, I also understand that the, the detailed elements of this bill, of uh, this proposal, were not in print until just a couple weeks ago. And so understandably, the counties uh, have, uh, certainly my counties, have raised uh, some worry about what exactly is in here and how it matches up and the concerns that, they've been, that they have. And, and, and so I know this has been so, somewhat of a fast-moving train. And, and, uh, and I'm, I'm pleased to see that, the, that there's been some accommodation with CSAC and that we're taking amendments that raise, that, that respond to a number of the things that they have, that they have raised. So that's all, all very positive. And the, the distress for me, at least at this point in time, is that because uh, my counties have not been fully informed of uh, these changes, that I get a letter this morning that says things that are quite hostile towards this proposal. Um, including language that says, as in regard to the alternative process, that it creates a few clear winners. So I wanted them to address this issue of how they could come to that conclusion, that that alternative process might create a few clear winners. And then I'd also like to understand how important it is this particular trailer uh, be, uh, be brought to the floor today. So if I could have those questions answered, I'd appreciate it. Before we get to the answer to your questions, which are very reasonable and expected, because of the timing, specifically of these amendments, this trailer bill will not be on the floor today. Great. So um, yeah, I appreciate th those that have not That's... been publicly accessible for 72 hours will not be taken up until tomorrow. Okay. That, thank you for that clarification, sure. Mr. Chair. But please proceed. Um, so I'm not sure what, how someone comes to the conclusion that there are clear winners. The alternative process was set up to allow those counties that had the capacity to do this on their own. Um, so they don't need a facilitator like uh, HCD to operate the program for themselves. Um, we just thought that there would be kind of unnecessary for, the, for those counties who can do this on their own. And um, so I'm not sure how they are they're necessarily not a winner. Any different proportion of the money? No. That, so they would those 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 counties that would otherwise be eligible for the alternative process. The most that they would be able to get if they choose again, they have to choose to go into that process would be based on their homeless um, count as well. So it's the exact same as everyone else. They would not get any more. They and and you cannot compete in the competitive pot if you choose to go into the alternative, you can only do one or the other. Right, but the competitive pot creates an implication that it's com competitive, which means that everyone's not treated the same, right? I mean, well, why have a competition? Based on your proposal as you come to apply for the firm. Right, so, but, so almost by definition, you give the impression that uh, some proposals may be better than others, and it's not gonna be distributed based on proportion of 
of the mentally homeless and your so maybe your I should clarify a bit at least in the, in the alternative pot you still have to meet the criteria and the objectives of the program that will be established through the guidelines set up by HCD in consult consultation with CSAC so you still have to have a viable project that meets all the various requirements that, that's a good thing but you understand maybe not just my confusion but others that when you take them out of the competitive pot where you're competing it's not a per capita or proportion distribution that it creates an implication that you're not that those four large counties are no longer competing right for the money they're going to get it and everybody else is going to be uh, maybe not be a winner because they may not have a proposal as good as somebody else Well, uh, Mr. Chair, if I may, I'd also yes, know that in addition, as we said, there is the over-the-counter money for all counties, the $200 million. So, you know, there are several different pots of money um, beyond the competitive and the alternative program that we were discussing so that um, counties, in addition with this uh, particular amendment, um, the smaller counties um, have, you know, a floor of, of funding that they will receive. Right. And that doesn't apply to my counties. I appreciate that. But I think that's why maybe that, that creates some level of confusion about whether there are winners and losers in this, and they use that language in their letter. But I think the fact that the chair has explained that this is not going to be something that's going to be voted on today, it will provide, I think, the pressure release to get some more answers and clarifications, and I appreciate and that. Just in uh, support of what's before us and in recognition of the really earnest and hard work that went into the final product, including the amendments that are before us. And I know it can be a bit confusing here, but with regard to the competitive pod, to make it as fair as possible, we have these four categories. So a small county or a county with a lesser population is not competing against San Francisco or Santa Clara. And because Los Angeles is unique just due to the size of its population, its homeless population, we San Francisco won't be competing against it. It will have its own then San Francisco and others about its size will compete among themselves. And then counties more the size of yours will be competing among counties of that size. So I think the design is set up so there will be as much fairness as possible. And that's by design and I think it's a good thing. Other questions? Uh, Senator Nielsen, did you get yours in? Okay, Senator Murlock. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think Senator uh, Glazer asked most of my questions, but uh, I was there as well as Skid Row for the uh, introduction of this uh, initiative back in January. So just as we're trying to assimilate all this data, because I'm trying to stay on top sure, of this sure. bill as well, so I appreciate the extension of 24 hours. Um, but uh, Prop 63, are we, are we, I guess it's my understanding that we're going to have some kind of better accountability, but it will be in a separate bill as opposed to this one. Because I, I just joined Senator, former Senator Daryl Steinberg at a press conference where he's trying to explain how beneficial Prop 63 has been around the state as opposed to what a state auditor's report has said. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping someone is taking that initiative that we have better accountability of what's being done with our Prop 63 funding. I would just note that the bill before you today sets up the programmatic elements. The financing portion of the securitization of Prop 63 is not included in this, and that will require subsequent legislation. Okay, so that's a different question. You're saying that the debt funding is in a different bill than this one? It's not included in this bill. This bill simply sets up the programmatic elements. Okay. Then um, will we have oversight then when we do the bill for issuing the debt? So my understanding, Senator Morlock, is that the language of the bond itself is still being written, and that's where a lot of this accountability will be in place, but I'm happy to have you add to that. Yeah, we can definitely address that through through that other measure. We, are, we currently have a working group that's going on between the Treasurer's Office, the AG's Office, Outside Bond Council, and the Department of Finance, and, more, and working towards drafting of the actual bond language for this program, um, which will be inserted into the, uh, the section of Prop 63 that deals with the allocation of the funding. And then I appreciate the fact that you're being as fair as you possibly can, that you're working with CSAC to be, you know, because because the tax is generated by those with taxable income of a million dollars or more. And so I'm glad you're not apportioning it 
by where they live. Because that would be a whole different animal. And we might, you know, it's just a nice thing that we're putting it all in the one pot and we're allocating it. So I just make that as an observation, Mr. Chair. Thank you. It's a generous observation. I appreciate that. Yeah. And, and, a, and a fair one. Senator Woke and then Senator Hancock. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm glad that we have a little bit more time. I have a, uh, just a couple of questions. Um, perhaps others have, the, the, the counties are gonna be the, the um, recipient of and the sort of the energy behind uh, the application for funds or, okay. So my question is, um, of the six counties that I represent, um, I would say at least three of them, um, the homeless, homeless population is really in cities. That's because that's where the development has been with intention. Um, where will there be um, the sort of inclusion of, required inclusion of um, working with the cities in developing their approach to, to using the money? Sure, so in any um, affordable housing development project, including what we're doing here for the support of permanent, permanent support of housing is, you're gonna have to work with the, the local government entity for which that facility will be cited and, and developed in. So when the counties come forward with their proposals, they will have to engage their partners um, at the city levels in their counties and when they develop their proposals. So is that going to be, clear in the regulations that are um, in consultation with CSAC, which is called out, uh, and other stakeholders? Are we calling out others? Well, we'll definitely be taking into consideration the input of cities um, when developing uh, the guidelines. Um, All right. Um, how did you come up with the 8%? Explain to me the 8% set aside for the rural. I only have one county in that, but I'm kind of curious. Explain that to me. You have an 8% rural set aside. Right, so this is one area where we struggled a little bit in terms of de deciding how much we thought was fair enough, but we landed on an 8% because we felt that that provided a sufficient size pot of funding for which uh, many of those count rural counties can then um, compete for. We wanted to make sure there was gonna be enough funding in that small county pot so that you can actually do projects and that we can do obviously more than one project. Um, so by setting it at 8%, we'll be able to get multiple projects for some of these uh, smaller counties um, funded. All right, thank you very much. Thanks, Mr. Chair.